Howdy folks, and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles. So, French destroyers. This is Marf 1007 in the French Tier 6 destroyer, the Japard, uh, which I'm probably mispronouncing, and which is French for cheetah. And that's cheetah as in the African big cat, not, you know, cheetah as in somebody who cheats. Um, what to say about these French destroyers? Speaking personally, this is not a line of ships that I feel any burning need to try exploring. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, one is to do with, well, they kind of have a high skill floor. Opposite of a high skill ceiling. A ship that has a high skill ceiling typically is the kind of ship that anybody can play reasonably well, but only the very good are going to be able to excel in. The French destroyers are the opposite of that. They have a high skill floor. You kind of have to be pretty damn good to even have a reasonably good game in them. And the reason I say that, well, you've probably noticed by now that none of these French destroyers come with smoke screens. Now, not having a smoke screen is one thing, but you combine that lack of a smoke screen with worst in class surface and air detection range, and you begin to see the problem. You have an entire line of destroyers that have the worst stealth, even worse than the Russians and the Germans. They have no smoke screens. And they're fairly big destroyers. These were more destroyer leaders than destroyers. They're almost the size of light cruisers. You begin to see why these things have such a high skill floor. But I think mostly it comes down to a question of timing. If these ships had been introduced into the game a year ago, before the aircraft carrier rework, while they still wouldn't have been easy to play, they probably would have been quite fun and moderately effective. However, they've introduced them after the aircraft carrier rework. So what they've done is, right at the time when aircraft carriers are shitting all over destroyers post-CV rework, they've introduced a line of destroyers that are more vulnerable to being spotted by carriers than any other, and don't even have a smokescreen to hide in. In fact, the only way this matchmaking could be any worse for Marth is if there was some radar on the enemy team as well. As it is, he's a bottom tier destroyer in a tier 8 battle with a tier 8 aircraft carrier. Having said that, though, I'm not entirely sure what the enemy Graf Zeppelin player's plan was. I mean, first he launches a torpedo attack against a destroyer. Technically, two destroyers. The friendly Kiev was also spotted. But then he doesn't hang around. He drops one set of torpedoes that miss by a mile, and then he recalls the entire squadron, so he's not even keeping them spotted. He didn't even leave a squadron of fighters to keep them spotted, because being spotted is the single biggest threat that carriers pose to destroyers. Yes, they can do a lot of damage to destroyers with their dive bombers and their rocket attack planes, but it's keeping them spotted. That's the major threat. But he's not even doing that. So, on the bright side, while he might be a bottom tier destroyer in a tier 8 battle with a tier 8 aircraft carrier, the enemy tier 8 aircraft carrier, at least, appears to be a bit of a window licker. And there's the enemy Japan. Naked underage boats. Doesn't have any camo, so he got out spotted. Doesn't have the last stand skill because his engine got knocked out and he immediately used his damage control. And now, as quickly as that, he's dead. That's how quickly destroyers die, or can die, if they've been spotted. So the enemy Graf Zeppelin kind of dropped the ball on that one. And then, I don't know if you were paying attention to the map, but he then followed up his lack of surveillance on these two destroyers running riot all over the cap here in the middle of the map by launching a squadron of rocket attack planes and sent them over Charlie, which was being capped by the Fabuki, but the Fabuki's very stealthy, so I doubt they spotted him in time to actually launch a strike, and then he overflew the Fabuki and ran his rocket attack planes straight into the anti-aircraft guns of the Queen Elizabeth, also over by Charlie. The Queen Elizabeth, of course, has one of, if not the strongest, anti-aircraft batteries of any Tier Six battleship. And then, spoiler alert, he's going to continue to completely ignore the two destroyers that are most easily spotted from the air, running right over the cap here in the centre of the map, in order to continue driving attacks home on that Queen Elizabeth. And if you think that's bad, and it is, although it's good news for Marth, don't worry, Marth's carrier, also a Graf Zeppelin, isn't any better. Meanwhile, enemy Z-39 spotted through the channel, Marth is not going chasing after him, because that guy has a very long duration, very long-ranged Hydro, and momentarily clipped Marth there. So, yeah, let's not get any closer to the Z-39 unless we have to. Anyway, momentarily going back to further reasons why I have no real interest in going down this line of French destroyers. 
So we've talked about the terrible stealth in a game where spotting and scouting is dominated by aircraft carriers. You have a destroyer that gets spotted from the air further away than any other nation's destroyers and doesn't have a smoke screen to hide in, but does get a very, very long duration engine boost. Yes, that's right, French destroyers. Everybody knows they're incredibly fast. Well, they're not, actually. They are from Tier 8 and on, and some of the premiums, but not this thing. It has a top speed of 36 knots. 37.5, I think, with a speed flag, and just over 40 when you're running the engine boost. But its base speed is actually kind of pedestrian. It's one knot faster than the T-61 and the Fubuki, and half a knot faster than the Icarus. Every other Tier 6 destroyer is at least as fast, or faster, than the Gepard without the engine boost running. So, to summarise, horrible stealth, worst in class stealth, no smokescreen to hide in, large targets by destroyer standards, and most of the time, actually kind of slow. So why the hell would anybody want to play these things? Well, there are a couple of reasons. They're not boring. <laughs> They're a fairly high adrenaline uh, playstyle class of ships. Their firepower is pretty good. Like the Russians, they start with 130mm guns, but unlike the Russians, once you get to tier 6, they graduate to 139mm guns, and the high explosive shells pack even more of a punch uh, than that enjoyed by the Royal Navy 120mm gun arm destroyers. And that's saying something. That firepower is also further augmented by the main battery reload booster. It doesn't last very long, but it doubles your rate of fire, and the rate of fire isn't that bad to begin with, considering the large calibre of these main batteries. So if you're in the market for a bit of DACA, you could definitely do a lot worse than these French destroyers. Also, their torpedoes aren't bad at all. I mean, there's nothing especially great about them, but there's nothing especially bad about them either. They typically have that 9km range that you associate with the French cruisers. They're reasonably quick, they have a reasonably quick reload, they do a reasonably large amount of damage. The torpedoes are perfectly good. And once you get a tier 8, these things start to become extremely quick, with speeds starting at 42 knots and they also get the engine boost, and with that thing active, some of these higher tier French destroyers can actually outrun a lot of torpedoes. But in order to get there, you're going to have to play through these. And so I mention all of this to put into perspective the sheer challenge that Marf is faced with. A bottom tier destroyer in a tier 8 battle with a tier 8 aircraft carrier on the enemy team Worst in class surface detection, worst in class air detection, no smoke screen, a ship that's a massive target and is actually kind of slow most of the time. These are the kind of challenges that Marth is going to have to overcome just to even be as good as anybody else, let alone excel. So bear all that in mind while you watch him play. Also, I suppose, you know, to be completely fair, we should also point out or remind you that the enemy aircraft carrier, the Graf Zeppelin, is a bit of a potato. But then again, that is all kind of balanced out by the fact, because it is a fact, that the Graf Zeppelin on Morph's team is a bit of a potato as well. Actually, that's kind of significant for other reasons, which will become apparent towards the end of this match. But again, I'd also ask you to bear in mind that both premium Tier 8 aircraft carrier players on each team are kind of window lickers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, look, it doesn't make them bad people, does it? But they're basically just not very good. But bear that in mind, um, because it's actually going to be quite significant later as well. Meanwhile, the Massachusetts. Well, he appears to have had his engine knocked out, so he's a bit of a sitting duck. Although, let's not write the Massachusetts off, because he was at least smart enough to not blunder right into the ambush that the Kiev was trying to set for him. Unfortunately, he has been kind of caught a little bit broadside on in front of the guns of a whole bunch of other ships, but it's a Massachusetts. Its secondaries are no joke, and they're actually starting to score hits. The Kiev, of course, has a smokescreen that he can hide in. <laughs> a smokescreen that Marth is definitely taking advantage of. The issue here, of course, 
is that despite raining down death and destruction on the Massachusetts, the enemy have taken Bravo. Well, it wasn't actually the Massachusetts that did it. He helped, but he was really just drawing fire. It's the Z-39, who right up until now was hiding inside a little smoke screen. He's the one who actually got the cap. The Massachusetts has gone down. He actually managed to detonate from a torpedo strike, so on the bright side, he's earned a few flags out of it. But while the Z-39 has capped, he's left it way too late to get out of there. He's now caught in a crossfire between, well, pretty much everything. And he's not going to last much longer. Now, I don't know if you've been paying attention, but while all of this was going on, several players on the team have been furiously pinging the western end of the map border to attempt to draw the friendly aircraft carrier's attention to the fact that the friendly Bayern, who's running south, is being pursued and hunted by one of the enemy destroyers. There are only two left. And since we've just seen the Z-39 go down and the Gallant was spotted capping Charlie, that means that the Bayern, who is running south, is being hunted by an Asashio. Now remember the Asashio's torpedoes, they're deep water torpedoes, they can only hit battleships and aircraft carriers. Just in case the carrier hasn't gotten the point yet, they're still pinging the map and they're actually explaining it to him in very small words in chat. And he's just launched a squadron of dive bombers. Perfect for hunting down destroyers. And he's not going to look. <laughs> he's not using those dive bombers to go and locate the Asashio. He has at least dropped a fighter squadron on top of the buy-in. So, you know, we'll give him that much. But that's not really the point at this stage, because look at where... Look at where the friendly Graf Zeppelin is. More importantly, look which way he's heading. <laughs> We've already established that there's an Asashio over there. They're even pinging the map exactly in the position where they suspect the Asashio to be by now. Because of course he's given up going after the Bayern. He's been joined by an Atago. So who else is the Asashio going to be going for right now? Could it be the aircraft carrier that's steaming towards him at full speed? So, you know, it's like I said, if both teams were to suddenly lose these two aircraft carriers, it's entirely likely that the average IQ of each team would actually go up a couple of points. If either of these two guys were to drop off the surface of the planet tomorrow, I think it's fairly safe to say that the research into the cure for cancer would not be affected. The very worst thing that might happen is you might have to bag your own groceries at the supermarket. Neither of these guys are going to be that great a loss. I mean, you might have to lick your own windows until a suitable replacement could be found for a while, but that's pretty much it. And, oh look, guess where the Asashio just popped up? <laughs> wow, somebody should have warned the Graf Zeppelin. Oh wait, everybody was warning him for at least the last three minutes, and yet he sailed right into an Asashio anyway. And speaking of sailing right into things... Some nice torpedoes there from Marth. Just sank the Gallant, hiding inside his smokescreen. Let's just take a quick look. Can we actually see them from here? Not quite. They're just a little bit too far out of range. But that's where the action is all happening right now. The Asashio is closed within a couple of hundred metres of the Graf Zeppelin. So why am I trying to drive the point home that neither of these two aircraft carrier players are particularly good at playing aircraft carriers? I mean, it doesn't make them bad people. And in one case, the friendly Graf Zeppelin you can explain it by the fact that he's only ever played five games in aircraft carriers and all of those in the premium tier 8 Graf Zeppelin. So he should be easy meat for an Asashio that's caught him at point blank range, right? Well, no, actually, because he's managed to sink the Asashio. The Asashio got him as well, but the Asashio didn't survive the encounter. That was a suicide run. Going after the carrier basically signed the Asashio's death warrant. When did that start happening? When did it suddenly become suicidal for destroyers, or hell, even cruisers or battleships for that matter, to go after aircraft carriers, regardless of how much of a muppet the captain of the carrier was? When did it start becoming suicidal to attempt to close to range and sink them? Because it never used to be like that. Carriers never used to be particularly hard to kill. Once they were spotted, as long as they were in range, they were usually dead very, very soon afterwards. But it hasn't been like that since the aircraft carrier rework, has it? Oh, hang on a second. Moth's about to land some very, very useful torpedoes. Yep, and there's the Confederate award. Oh, that is... Yeah, that's a dead buy-in. He doesn't have his damage control, so he's flooding and he's got two fires. That is a dead buy-in. 
It's just a question of who's going to get the kill. And it's probably going to be Mark, because I'm pretty sure he set at least two of those fires as well as the floods. But can you remember what it used to be like when the only thing left on the enemy team was the carrier? There was this mad scramble to see who could get to the other end of the map in time to farm the damage and get the kill. And yep, there goes the buy-in, as expected. No big surprise there. But yeah, only one thing left, guys. It's the carrier. And you're sitting there cursing yourself because you're in a slow ship and you, 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 wouldn't have, you were never going to get there in time to join in the feasting. And now, when the only thing that's left on the enemy team is the carrier, everybody kind of shuffles their feet nervously and looks at each other and says, well, go on, then you first, and then screw that, you're the curious one, you go first. Yeah. Oh, Jingles, you're making far too much of this. Oh, come on, Jingles, you, you're making far too much of this. You can't possibly draw those kind of conclusions just from one destroyer going after one carrier. Well, I'm not drawing them from just one destroyer going after one carrier. I've seen it happen over and over and over again. It's not just destroyers, it's cruisers and battleships as well. This is just one example that I'm showing you. Well, actually it isn't. This is two examples that I'm showing you because the friendly Akatsuki is doing exactly the same thing to the enemy Graf Zeppelin, all the way up there to the north. And as we established at the beginning of this game, that enemy Graf Zeppelin is a bit of a potato too. The Akatsuki player, on the other hand, well, he's played 3,500 games in cruisers and 2,500 games in destroyers, and he's gotten a kill in this match, as well as a cap. And I think he seriously overestimated that Graf Zeppelin. He was in the position to cap Charlie and instead went north, obviously thinking, well, there's no way an aircraft carrier is going to leave me to cap Charlie uncontested. And so, possibly against his better judgment, he's taken the fight to the carrier. But he's not a bad player, and the carrier, well, at least in carriers, definitely is. But how much of a difference do you think that's going to make? A decent destroyer player against an utter potato carrier player Who's going to win that fight? I know who should win that fight. I mean, <laughs> we all know who should win that fight. But what should happen doesn't have anything to do with it when you're going up against a carrier. Any bets on the Akatsuki? Nope, too late. All bets are off. The scores are in. Potato 1, veteran destroyer player, nil. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is, on top of everything else that Wargaming have done and continue to do to rebalance aircraft carriers, maybe their ridiculous survivability should be something else that we add to the list. Because if a carrier gets caught with its pants around its ankles, it should die. It should not be a death sentence for anybody who catches the carrier with its pants around its ankles. They're too good at everything else to be so hard to kill into the bargain. And it's just incredibly lucky for Marth 1007 here, although he did play very well, that in a game where he was in a bottom tier destroyer with an enemy aircraft carrier two tiers higher than him in a very large target with no smoke screen, a target that's kind of slow most of the time unless it has its engine boost running, and also has the worst for its tier surface and air detection range, he was just kind of lucky really that the enemy aircraft carrier was a bit of a potato. Didn't really bother him at all, except for right at the start of the game when he should have been the enemy aircraft carrier's number one priority and was also kind of lucky that he was never put into the position, unlike the Akatsuki, where he had to go and face him. Otherwise, this battle would almost certainly, regardless of the skill levels of the various players involved, have had a very different outcome. And on that bombshell, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm very interested to see what you think in the comments, and as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.